That's a toe, brother. Golly. What's up, guys? Welcome to today's episode. We're actually switching things up a little bit. As you can tell, we're not in the kayak today. Now, I'm hooking up with my longtime friend. And when I say longtime, neither of us had gray hair when we met. So that's how long we've been friends. Juan Verut, Juan's from right here in the State College PA area. He's actually gearing us up right now. So what we're doing is some mountain stream fly fishing. So I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. For, fly fishing has always been a part of my fishing, but I've always called fly fishing my fishing. And part of the reason is to a certain extent, there's a little bit of an elitist mentality in a lot of the fly fishing world. But I think I've kind of overlooked the fact that it's because guys like us don't necessarily promote it that we don't expose it to a crossover audience. So we're not gonna be doing any river runs through it type stuff. We're not gonna be trying to sell you an $800 fly rod. We're gonna talk about going fly fishing, catching fish and experiencing like all this awesomeness and just adding something to your fishing arsenal. I believe if you're a fly fisherman, it makes you a better conventional fisherman. And if you're a conventional fisherman, it makes you a better fly fisherman. So the more that you can expand your horizons, the more you learn about fishing, the better angler you become. So Juan's gonna walk us through catching these mountain stream trout. Now, I'm a big meat slinging fly fisherman. I throw poppers and bait fish patterns and clousers and half and halves and things like that for redfish and snook and tarpon and bass and big trout. I've never fished for these really small mountain stream fish. So this is gonna be a new leaf for me. So Juan's gonna be my my mentor, my guide, my teacher, cause that's who he is and what he does. And uh, we're going over there. All right, so Juan, talk to us about what we're doing. Well, what we're gonna do is fish for a native brook trout in a really small mountain stream. It's a tributary to a bigger trout stream that's probably stocked okay. uh, in Shannon State Forest. Um, it's called, we call it blue lining. A lot of people call it blue lining. You're out there. I found this place, honestly, last week. I was looking on a map, found some blue lines, tributaries going. So blue lining there. means you look on the map and you see a blue line. And actually I call it blue, blue lining. And when I'm bass fishing, I call it blue spot. And if I got my GPS on and I see a blue spot, I actually wrote about this in the book, Kayak Bass Fishing. When you see those blue spots, explore them. Download an app like Farwide that tells you who owns the land and it'll blow your mind how much access there is. We're out here in a beautiful it's state forest, right? Yes. We're out here in a beautiful state forest, and if you look around the parking lot, we're the only ones here. So that's what's beautiful about doing the blue line thing and getting out there and exploring. So hopefully we're gonna find some fish that haven't seen a thousand of these flies swung in front of their face. This is all new to me. You guys are gonna be learning while I'm learning. We're, we're chasing some uh, mountain trout. Happy Valley, Pennsylvania. All right guys, so I got a little tip for you when it comes to walking through the woods. And you know, this is gonna be a fly fishing tip for this segment, but this really applies to conventional or anytime, anytime you're going through the woods. So take your fly rod, put it behind your forearm and lead with the butt section. And you'll go through stuff a lot easier just pushing right through it. If you try to take the tip of your rod and go through it, it's getting caught on everything. So go butt first or handle first through the woods you'll avoid frustration, you won't break a rod. And if you slip and you go to fall, you don't have that rod out in front of you to break it. You usually let go of it to brace yourself and the rod's fine. You might hurt yourself, but go butt first anytime you're walking through the woods with a fishing rod. All right, so one thing I can tell you right out of the gate, is new water and new boots at the same time is a little sketchy. Uh, what I mean by that is I normally wear a hiker style boot uh, because I do a lot of like backpacking into the places where I fly fish. So I decided when I was at Fish USA to upgrade to some really nice Sims boots. And the thing about the boots are, especially when you put the neoprene gator over the top of them, is they're buoyant. And when they're buoyant and you've got that fast moving water, every time you pick your foot up, it tends to want to float downstream a lot faster than I'm used to. So new water and new boots, take it a little bit slower. Probably would have been better off sticking with the hikers for this type of fishing that's got a little bit more weight to them um, and doesn't necessarily hold as much air. But these Sim bo Sims boots are awesome. They're definitely sure-footed. I haven't had any issues on these slick rocks, but something to be mindful of is if you're going in new water with new footwear, take it slow, like really slow. 
Like slow is evolution and then slow it down a little bit more. <laughs> All right, so Juan, do me a favor and explain to, to me, this spot behind me looks gorgeous without me knowing anything about it, but explain to me your approach to something like this. Sure, you got a pull, and what I usually do is divide a pull into thirds, bottom third, top, middle third, top third. What I'm gonna do for the approach though here is we got a nice little natural feature, which is that little waterfall, and it's gonna cover our sound coming up on that, and it's gonna keep us lower too, so, and the fish are facing upstream. So we're basically gonna step in the water, but below that little fall there, cover us basically sight and sound, and then cast the bottom third a little bit, and then just keep working our way up longer casts up through the pool. So a lot like if you're frog fishing, if you're a bass fisherman, and you make super long casts and you hook up, you spook every fish between you and there. So if you notice how Juan explained it is, you divide it into thirds, but you fish the third closest to you first, then the third farthest away. And that's not intuitive. A lot of anglers think make the farthest cast they can. Problem is you hook that fish and then you spook it, everything between you and it. So I like that, the way you articulated that. And this is the same thing that you do for a creek arm when you're bass fishing. You work the first third, then you work the middle third, then you work the last third. You don't paddle all the way to the back and then fish back out, so. Exactly. Here we go. It maximizes your chance at more fish. So Chad, what I'm gonna do here, number one, we're gonna fish an indicator so that we can, basically a strike indicator. This is a small like a bobber. foam, basically a bobber. Yeah. yeah, when you're five years old, you call it a bobber. <laughs> when you grow up and become a fly fisherman, then you gotta call it something fancy. It charges like three strike. times as much for right. it. Right, call it a strike indicator. When I was a kid, that cost five cents, okay? <laughs> yeah. So basically we run this down to, down to our tippet, a couple feet of tippet here. We got one split shot to get the, because we got faster water, turbulent water. We want to get the nymph down. So we're fishing subsurface. And in this case, we got a nymph and it's a waltz worm with a little bit of a chartreuse hot spot on it. Okay. So it kind of looks like a caddis larva is basically okay. what it imitates. And so these fish are, are used to seeing that kind of stuff in the water. So they're used to knowing that that's something that they should be eating. Oh, I had one. Ah. What I'm doing right now is, honestly, is just watching. One of the best ways to become a better angler is to go fishing with anglers that are better than you. And a lot of times we try to pay attention to the big thing and the big things are easy. What you have to look for is those little tiny subtle differences that the other person is doing that you're not. How are they raising their rod tip? How are they managing their flow of their fly? How are they putting the action on their lure? A lot of times it's not the big thing that they're doing different, it's that little tiny that 2% thing they're doing different. So I'm gonna watch and learn and then try to apply it. Um, about eight to 10 inches above, maybe eight inches above, honestly, because in here, it, it's so fast, you, you gotta put the weight closer to the nymph. I tell you what, you were good at estimating 10 inches. I don't think I, I could have put a ruler on that. That would have been exactly 10 inches. So you must understand 10 inches then. So what we're doing is we're basically following this mountain stream and we're just going upstream, pool to pool, fishing upstream and letting the bait come down the, or letting the lure come down natural, just like any, any bait would. One of the things that I've had to learn, cause this is my first time doing this is you have to be very mindful of your hook set and the path that your line will take if you miss it. So you pretty much want to load the rod. And if one comes loose, you got to drop your rod tip real quick to unload the rod. So it doesn't slingshot your line up in the tree. And same with the cast. You really got to find the hole you want and kind of plan your back cast and just kind of, or water load it and just flip it back out there. Uh, do a bow cast or a slingshot cast to flip the lure up under there. So, you know, one of the things I love about kayak fishing is it's, is it's part hunting and fishing combined. And really, that's what this is. Even though we're not going after 25, 20 to 25 inch fish, this is a lot of what's in my wheelhouse, hunting and fishing kind of combined. We're stalking these fish. You'll see Juan a lot crouching down and kneeling down and getting all the way down. And a lot of times I'll do that in the kayak where I sit down for my approach, even though I could stand up and it makes it easier for me to see the fish. But 
if I can see the fish easier, the fish can see me easier. So again, you have to be very mindful of that. And now that we've got the sun out, um, we've got to be very mindful of shadows. Uh, sun angle is a big deal. A lot of times if you throw a lure and the shadow gets there before the fish, it'll spook it. So now that the sun is coming out, you got to be mindful of that sun angle as well. Luckily, we've got the sun out in front of us, going to put our shadows behind us, but that's something you always got to think about. Oh, nice. Nice. That's awesome. Heck yeah. I caught this wild brook trout, well, native brook trout on a sulfur mint nymph. It's actually a pretty nice size one. Um, that's one of the hatches that's going on right now in the spring in Pennsylvania, sulfur hatch. And uh, so I caught that one on a sulfur nymph. What we ended up having to do, because the water is up, it's murkier, the fish don't seem to be coming to the surface as much. So instead of fishing a dry fly or even a dry dropper, I went to a straight strike indicator with about two to three foot of line underneath it, and then a beaded nymph underneath it, a sulfur nymph. And that, I think it, I think we're on to something now, and I think we're just gonna keep developing out this kind of pattern, this presentation pattern, to see if it holds, but I think we're on to something. Let's go ahead and let this fish back in the water. One of the things that I like to do, see my rod tip? I'll get it on the side of the water I want to fish, and it keeps my line out of the fast water, too. There you go. Oh, there he is. Fish. Ah. Right. Woo. That was good scene there. All right, so Juan, this is awesome, bro. But you literally were talking that this the conditions aren't ideal. Um, so talk to me about that. What's the what's the game plan from here on out? Yeah, I mean we did pretty good. I mean we caught one. We hooked we hooked a lot of fish. Actually, quite a few fish. But uh, the water's high. It's really cold. We had 30 some degree air temps at night here. Yep, yep. So the fishing's definitely slowed down. So what we're going to do is flip the now. So a let bit. me let me interrupt you just because as a lay person, and I know there's a lot of folks watching. Aren't these fish cold water fish? And so wouldn't cold water or cold weather make it better? Um, to some extent, but when you have warming trend and then it drops, the bottom drops out, mm -hmm. that's a change in temperature. And so then the fish has to change up, right? And this time of year, we rely on a lot of hatches to activate uh, the fish. And so- That makes sense. We get, I mean, we had, you know, we're, we're barely getting over like in the forties today, basically. So the hatch is like the conveyor belt, just yeah, like when the exactly. shad spawn for bass fishing. Yeah. When that exactly. hatch starts happening, it really yeah. turns on the feed. Yeah. And that's why the fishing is slow. I mean, we're doing okay. Yeah. Um, but I think it's better just to switch waters. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down to the, basically a world famous fishery. We've got Fly Fisherman's Paradise. We got Spring Creek and we're going to go down there and I'm actually going to teach you how to nymph. Okay, okay, tight line nymph, all right? I've never nymphed before. It, it's fancy schmancy, dude. I'm okay, so you. anyway, so we're gonna <laughs> head down back to Velfont. Guys, one of the things is we had to let the rain move up this morning and on the way up here, the deer were crossing the roads. So I know we were kind of getting in behind the feeding time. Look, I had four good shots at a fish. One that I really danced around the pool for a second, just let it get off. Um, I think Juan put the trick hooks on for me this morning just to make me work for it. But guys, this right here, this is the jam. If you want to try something different, mountain stream fly fishing, it's like gorilla fly fishing. It's yeah. freaking awesome. So listen, one of the things in fishing that you never do is you never give up. And uh, we're heading back down the mountain and Juan was like, listen, man, these fish are really not that picky. Um, so we're gonna hit these pools again. And we pulled up into a pool that I lost one in earlier, made a cast in there and like legitimately on the first cast, that little guy right there smashed it. That is my uh, first ever uh, brook trout, native brook trout in Pennsylvania. That is awesome. And you did it the right way too, Chad, on a beautiful, like really, a what we call blue line creek too man oh nice you know so uh let me get this hook out of this guy and uh we'll get him back in the water 
I want to make sure I don't hurt this dude. I didn't think I'd be excited catching bait, to be <laughs> honest with you, but that was freaking cool, man. Such a gorgeous fish. Look at that guy. All right. Yeah. All right, guys, so mission accomplished. I wanted to catch a mountain stream native brookie. Juan, thank you, bro. That was freaking awesome. Great. So now we're gonna go back down the mountain and see if we can't catch us a brown in a segment I'm gonna refer to as Downtown Browns. <laughs> well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, do me a favor and help support the channel by downloading the Fishing Chaos app now so you can get in on the action.